see somebody? Can you say uh, if you see the screen? Yep, it all looks good. Yeah. Okay, all right. Let me know. I did a presentation like a week ago, and the slides weren't advancing, and nobody told me for several slides. <laughs> so, all is well. All right, I'll just go ahead and do a, a quick introduction for myself. Uh, my name is Jared Shank. I'm a senior director for military and apprenticeship initiatives and special projects. Uh, we wanted to kind of feature a sort of military connected student theme, if you will, um, for the Veterans Day timeframe for our Transfer Talk Tuesday. So I thought we'd go through a few different kind of important things going on in the state, kind of give a new update on um, <clears throat> on MTAGs and how they work. Um, I know there's been a fair bit of turnover out there and I've been getting kind of more questions uh, than usual about uh, what MTAGs are and how they work and what schools need to do. Um, give you an overview of what the uh, Collegiate Purple Star designation is. Um, talk about a pay for success project that's happening with the Ohio National Guard. And then share just a few uh, useful resources for individuals on campus as well. Um, that being said, we're going to go ahead and get kicked off with some of the state uh, statistics. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my coworker, Abby Cohen. Um, Abby, you can introduce yourself and uh, go through the state uh, overview. Thank you, Jerry. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abby Cohen. I am the assistant director for initiative development and processing. I handle military assurance guides as well as transfer assurance guides. So for the state of Ohio, the GI bill brings in about 103 million dollars and this is just taking into account tuition and fee payments. Housing and books are separate from this and also bring in additional funds. This is just to show that there is often a large economic impact locally because of these GI bill users. And there are approximately 20,000 GI Bill military connected students in the state of Ohio. So this could mean active, reserve, guard, spouses, dependents that are all currently utilizing the GI Bill. Ohio is currently ranked 14th in GI Bill users and ranked 5th in veteran population. There are over 1,100 tuition assistance students, which is a benefit for the military. Tuition assistance is granted federally, whereas the Ohio National Guard Scholarship or ONGSP is a state funded scholarship. So military students can utilize both federal tuition assistance as well as the Ohio National Guard Scholarship. There are over 2,300 ONGSP students and the ONGSP recently expanded to not just be utilized for associates and baccalaureate degrees, but to also include licenses, certificates, and apprenticeships. There are over 1,800 war orphans and severely disabled veteran scholarship recipients, which is correlated to dependents of veterans to show other military connected involvement. And all of these numbers basically give us a ballpark of ballpark idea of how many military connected students there are in Ohio. This is a conservative estimate because these are only the students tied to some type of federal benefit or financial aid. I'm going to go over to Jared. All right. Thank you, Abby. Uh, one of the things I uh, forgot to mention is um, we are going to record this, so it will be posted on our Transfer Talk Tuesday webpage so you can reference it. And I've incorporated a lot of links into this PowerPoint. Um, because many of these links are way too long to, to put out on the, the slide in general. Um, so we're also going to save and post that the, the PowerPoint as well. So don't feel like you need to take uh, uh, notes or anything. Um, we'll have this posted out there and all these links are active that you can click on as well for, for reference to these. All right, um, we're gonna jump into MTAGs, uh, Military Transfer Assurance Guides. Um, they were created, uh, essentially they had to be in place by December 31st of 2014. Um, so really most of the creation has happened, um, you know, 2015 and beyond. Uh, the legislation at that time caused us to essentially treat the military like a new Ohio institution. Um, <clears throat> we had to figure out how to get military transfer course, you know, the courses and the transfer to function and work. And at that time we kind of thought, well, our various other transfer initiatives seem to be working. Can we treat it in the same manner? Um, that allowed us to sort of have a lot of buy-in at the very beginning, because a lot of faculty trusted the process of uh, what was then the transfer module, which now the Ohio Transfer 36, and then TAG courses and C TAG courses as well. Um, so just like you all have some type of coordinator or coordinators at your institutions who work with those 
OT36, the tag courses and the C tag courses, you work with faculty members to get your course information and then submit it um, to us at the Department of Higher Ed. Um, Abby and I kind of serve in that role for the military, if you will. Uh, we go out, we find military training, right. and we Let submit that to uh, Hopefully that'll help. Well. All right, thanks. Um, yeah. If anybody's just joined, make sure you're muted there. Um, so any potential MTAG matches are submitted to the faculty panels, just like courses from all of your institutions, the exact same uh, process is used. Uh, the faculty panel uh, for those particular areas then decides if the military course um, meets or does not meet the learning outcomes, You know, pretty much exactly the same way that that process is handled uh, for your institutions as well. Um, if that course, the military course, is successfully matched, uh, it officially becomes known as a military transfer assurance guide, an MTAG. Um, we kind of do all the uh, behind the scenes work to make sure that that's entered appropriately in our uh, course equivalency management system or, or CEMS, as we call it. Um, then I go out and make sure that it's available on our transfer credit tool that we actually see that the course is out there. So we have a credit transfer tool um, that essentially will show you all of our statewide guarantees and what schools have in place for, for those various things. And M tags will show up there as well. Uh, so once we enter that into CEMS, I always kind of make sure that that course is in fact visible um, out there in the transfer credit tool. Uh, once that's been verified and put into place, uh, we draft a memo. <clears throat> and the memo basically says, you know, something along the lines of, um, you know, our the, the OATN staff has worked with such and such faculty panel to approve the following M tags. And then we post a, you know, a list of what those courses are. Um, and that's essentially the, the memo. It's very straightforward. And that gets sent out typically to your uh, chief academic officers. Um, that gets sent out often to the, the coordinators if there's um, the TAG, CTAG, OT36 type coordinators. And then I also have kind of a separate military credit list serve um, where people have told me from many institutions, hey, I want to be updated when new M tags or that information comes out. So I will add them to the uh, the military credit list serve. Um, I've incorporated a link here for the most recent uh, M tag memo that we sent out. That was at the beginning of October on October 5th. Um, that was involving a lot of electrical engineering technology courses. So there was 33 courses and 88 course alignments. So that was 33 unique military courses that were aligned with approximately 88 um, TAG options. So as you can tell, if you look at that math uh, between the two, um, the majority of those military courses had equivalents to three and in some cases four uh, TAG courses for their programs for that EET. Um, some of those fields in the EET that were updated with that um, are things that are likely going to be impacted by the, the work that we are all doing for Intel coming to Ohio. So we, we knew some of the things that they wanted to see in degree programs and some of those courses. Um, so we wanted to do kind of a full, you know, full, full court press, if you will, on MTAGs that were in those particular areas. So we kind of revamped a lot of that. We, we had a handful of MTAGs that were in those areas that were kind of getting outdated. And we saw that they had updated some course information, and then we found uh, a handful of completely brand new uh, military courses in those areas as well. Um, and again, that link is in the document here, and that will be posted there. Um, it also lives, we have an MTAG page out on our uh, Educational Partners uh, website as well. Um, so the next question that I've been getting um, a lot more lately is, what does our school need to do when M tags are announced? Um, I think people are always wondering, you know, what do they need to do to match a course to it? And, and all of those types of questions, kind of like you do when new tags and OT36 things come out and, and C tags and whatnot. So uh, step one is to basically look at that memo. And then I would say you're, you're inputting that equivalency into your system based on whatever system you use. So some of you have homegrown systems, some of you have spreadsheets, some of you use uh, DARS or DegreeWorks. Um, so whatever your system is for course equivalency information, um, ideally we want you to incorporate that military information that just came out. 
um, just like you would when new matches are done for other institutions in the state of Ohio and, and you're encoding those, it's basically the same way. Um, <clears throat> the next big thing that I try to explain to people is they, they will often ask me, well, how do we do a course match for our, you know, our course from Sinclair or Cleveland State to make sure that it's matched to this, this new MTAG course? Um, that is something that Abby and I basically handle behind the scenes. So an MTAG is essentially um, pretty much always attached to a OT36 course, a TAG course, or the CTAG course. Um, so when we put that MTAG into CEMS, we are putting it in, in reality, we're putting it in as an OT36 course, a TAG course, or a CTAG course. But when we select an institution, we select a title that's called military institution. So generically, we call everything M tags, but you know they are specific to OT36 tags or C tags. And when that match is done, that's automatically done behind the scenes with whatever course that your institution has submitted uh, for that Ohio articulation number uh, for that particular area. So, for example, I'll try to explain that in a little bit simpler terms. Um, just making up a course here. If you're looking at English composition for um, let's just, well, that's not really a tag course. Let's say um, <clears throat> a geography tag course. We'll just throw that out there. Um, if you have a match to it in the system and, you know, your institution, say Sinclair Community College and Ohio State, you both have your courses matched to that tag course behind the scenes, um, you can see that that course will transfer and apply at, at your institutions and great, grand, and marvelous. Um, if the military is then you know, updated and, and that geography course, let's say, is put in there as an M tag, uh, it will automatically be matched and show in that result because you have a course matched to that articulation number. Um, where it will not show is if your school is essentially out of compliance or not in compliance. So you have that course, you offer the geography course, and you have not submitted it into CEMS for your overall match for the tag course. Uh, in that particular case. So you do have to have your coursework kind of up to date. Uh, it behooves you to do that because if, if service members are using our credit transfer tool or, or transferology and they're looking for equivalencies for their military coursework, um, if you do not have your courses up to date or are out of compliance, then your institution will not show up in the results uh, that's being searched. So that's something to be aware of. The other thing I would say too, um, kind of common sense too, but if it's an MTAG that's in an area that you don't have, then there's really nothing that you're you're doing on your end of the spectrum to do a course match. Um, you do have to have obviously the equivalent course or program. So some of these might be like electrical engineering technology fields. So if you don't have that, uh, you know, the applied version or the technology type degree, um, then you might not have an equivalency out there. So that that's always kind of a question to ask too. Do we actually have this program? Do we have a course that looks equivalent? Um, if you do, Ideally, it should be matched behind the scenes. Uh, if not, it will not show up as an equivalency. So the next question is, what do we do with non M tags, essentially courses that aren't military transfer assurance guides? Um, this is where uh, we and you as institutions are expected to evaluate the students coursework to verify any potential applicability. So, as I've said a little bit ago, military transfer assurance guides are attached to our regular statewide transfer guarantees. So the OT36, um, TAG courses, and CTAGs. Um, you probably know internally at your own schools, that list of courses does not cover your entire course catalog. It's exactly the same thing for the military. You know, the, the amount of military courses that are potentially covered by the the tags and OT36 and C tags is is fairly small. So we're we're doing our best with the the M tag side of the house, but then we also want the institutions to evaluate all of the other things that don't have any type of a statewide guarantee attached to them. Um, military coursework is typically found on the Community College of the Air Force transcript. Uh, we commonly call that the CCAF transcript, or the Joint Services Transcript, which incorporates everything essentially that's not Air Force. So the Navy, the Marines, the Army, and the Coast Guard um, shows up on the Joint Services Transcript. Um, just as an FYI, when you look at this document, the Community College of the Air Force uh, Transcript that's linked there takes you to their transcript request page. 
uh, the joint service transcript link that is linked there uh, takes you to the page that has information where you as an institution can request the electronic version of the transcript. So I always say this time and time again, and, and some schools do this, some have not, or some do it and somebody leaves and they don't know that they have this ability. So I'll just reiterate the joint service transcript does allow you as an institution to be able to access an electronic version of the joint service transcript. The only thing you as an institution needs to do is have some type of written permission or consent form from the service member um, that you can access that. So I know I've known some schools that have put that on the admissions application. You know, if you want us to access your military transcript, you know, sign here and give us permission. And, and some schools have created a, a separate standalone form in their veterans office or their admissions office. And when veterans walk in and, and ask about it, they can just hand it to them and they sign it. Um, that record needs to be maintained. But once you do that, um, you as an institution can request access from the joint service transcript folks. Uh, they will give somebody at your school um, permission and access. And essentially you log into their system. Uh, you type in that service member's uh, social security number and their joint service transcript will pop up and you can download that and then merge that into you know, whatever system you use to post uh, those transcripts. Some other items that are out there, um, some things that have expanded in the world of military and we, we have sent out some memos about this, but I thought again, it's been a while, so it's important to reiterate some of these things that exist. Uh, there's a lot of things that are military that aren't on the Joint Service Transcript or the Community College of the Air, uh, the Air Force Transcript. Um, typically, they have some type of de Department of Defense type title. Um, one of the leading ones that we see more frequently with foreign languages is the Defense Language Institute. Um, then there's the Defense Acquisition University, and, and I'm not going to go through and read all of those, but you can see them all. Um, those actually will appear uh, with a regular ACE, American Council on Education, transcript. Um, a few years ago, the, for whatever reason, the Department of Defense decided to break away from their normal military contract with the Joint Service Transcript um, and take all of their Department of Defense schools and move it under, under the regular umbrella of kind of what I would call the normal ACE National Guide. So they will have a actual regular ACE transcript and not the joint service transcript, but that credit, that information is all on there. Uh, those courses are all military courses. And, and frankly, most of those DOD courses, you can actually find uh, significantly better information for evaluations with those courses uh, than some of the military versions that exist. So that is something to be aware of that has changed here in the last you know, five to seven years or so. Um, some resources that are on here, uh, these links are all active in work. So if you're the one doing these evaluations, I've been provided the link on here for the Community College of the Air Force course catalog. Uh, pretty much looks like a regular course catalog for schools. It gives you at least an idea of, you know, a course description and a few sentences uh, about it and whatnot. Um, the American Council on Education Military Guide is the guide that you use for the joint service transcript. So you go out there and it's essentially a search engine. Um, you can look up the military course you see on a transcript and it will provide you additional information. And they typically have included things that you would need for evaluations, like at, at least, you know, a few sentences or so about learning outcomes for a course and, and probably mention, you know, what the assessment method is and things like that, that faculty members are gonna be wanting to, to know and, and learn. Um, the other one is the regular American Council on Education National Guide. So as I mentioned before, those Department of Defense schools will show up on that National Guide. So um, you might need to switch gears if it's <clears throat> something that says Department of Defense in its title or Defense something or other in its title. There's, a, there's quite a few names. Um, those will show up on that guide and, and the link is there for that guide service as well. Uh, the Defense Language Institute, I've incorporated their link to their <laughs> course catalog. Um, pretty much the same as a regular institution. It is a standard course catalog. Their institution is largely focused on a significant amount of foreign languages. That's the entity that teaches all of the foreign languages uh, to the military and a lot of different government uh, services and government agencies. That institution, just like the Community College of the Air Force, is a regionally accredited institution. Uh, so it's treated a little bit differently by, by some of the folks out here. Um, I have heard lately, and this is anecdotal, but um, 
I have heard from numerous schools that they've been seeing an uptick in this, especially in Northeastern Ohio. And I'm not exactly sure why, um, but that's a good thing in my opinion. Uh, we have done quite a bit of work in the past to get MTAGs approved for the Defense Language Institute. We also have kind of a broad policy in place um, to handle things that we don't have in the state of Ohio. So obviously the military is teaching foreign languages in, you know, for the entire globe. Uh, there's all these obscure languages out there that our colleges just simply don't have the, the faculty to teach them the level of interest from the students. Um, so we, we came up with some policies to handle, you know, what do you do when a student comes in with a diploma completed in, you know, Swahili or, or some more obscure language that we just don't teach. And, and essentially we're asking you to treat that the same way you would for a student who's completed your, your foreign language program at your school, but that is out in our policy manual. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about the Collegiate Purple Star. Uh, this is something that came out in spring of 22. A lot of our institutions, uh, especially our public institutions, were really wanting to come up with some type of military-friendly designation for our institutions. Um, so there were a lot of issues with other veteran-friendly designations. I won't go into lots of details, but for those of you, if you've dug into some of those, there's some schools that are ranked, you know, top of the country, and and there was an Ivy League school once that was ranked at the top of the country, and they didn't even have a single veteran enrolled uh, on their campus. Uh, there's a lot of them that have become pay to play, so we wanted to develop a state of Ohio kind of branded designation for this. Um, it's called Purple Star, just so you know. Uh, on the K-12 side of the house, it's well, technically it's pre-K-12 side of the house. Uh, they have the regular Purple Star designation for basically being a military-friendly school. Um, now we've uh, we've kind of completed that loop and circle, if you will, by creating the Collegiate Purple Star. So we are the college level, um, so that the state of Ohio can kind of provide wraparound services, you know, throughout that whole lifespan of education, if you will. Um, we do two cycles uh, for this application process: one in the spring, one in the fall. Uh, and basically that application process verifies the supports and services that are being offered on campus. This is not an easy, simple thing that you can just knock out in five, 10 minutes, filling out some information and, and sending it off. Um, there's a pretty significant amount of stuff an institution needs to have, do and have in place uh, for helping service members and military connected students. Um, so it is not something that is just awarded lightly. Um, the fall 2023 cycle just ended a little bit ago and we did an announcement on uh, November 8th uh, for the next schools. We had a few more schools added to the list, which brought it uh, currently to 51 different institutions in the state of Ohio that have earned the designation. So it is available for public institutions as well as private and independent colleges and universities as well. Um, and in one case, we actually have a an out of state entity in uh, Western governors that applied and did this because they they do have authorization to operate in the state of Ohio. So we felt since they could operate in the state of Ohio that they were you know, able to apply and, and they have earned that designation um, here in the state of Ohio. So you can see the breakdown there of the, the public and the, the independent colleges. So the independent colleges in this case, for example, uh, one of the requirements, albeit a very long requirement in the application process is that you're adhering to all of the legislation that currently exists for our public institutions. So the public institutions just have to kind of re-verify that you are doing um, eight or nine different things that were done in legislation. Private institutions now have to verify that and adhere to those same things if they want this designation. So very different can of worms. You know, traditionally legislation does not directly impact a lot of the privates, but I think those schools have seen they want to be military friendly and, and move forward in that arena. They need to kind of get on par with what many of our public institutions have done. So again, for example, 17 of them have stepped forward and, and agreed to start moving in that direction. So it's a very good thing um, that we're seeing in the state of Ohio. I've also included the homepage there that you can see. Uh, that's where the purple star and all the information lives. Uh, there's a nice map of the state of Ohio with all the purple star campuses uh, designated with stars. And then on the, the top right of this slide, uh, you'll see what the Collegiate Purple Star logo looks like for the state of Ohio. Um, we were the first state in the country to create the pre-K through 12 Purple Star, and we were also the first state in the country to create the Collegiate Purple Star. Uh, we've now had several other states uh, that are starting to ask and, and figure out ways to replicate this. 
Uh, notably, Indiana and Florida have passed legislation to create this award, and several other states have set up meetings with me and have been talking about this, and there's definitely interest in moving this along and creating more. Um, another thing I'm going to mention here um, <clears throat> is a pay for success project that is currently underway. Um, really just started, probably going to see it or hear more about it probably come spring because there'll be more students uh, enrolled and involved in it. Um, but this impacts the Ohio National Guard uh, scholarship program users. So we wanted to do something um, at the whole state level to look at improving learning outcomes for the Ohio National Guard. Uh, those folks who are using the Guard Scholarship Program. Um, however, uh, we couldn't get the funding we wanted from the General Assembly, and we were going to kind of shelve the project, if you will, for a couple years and then kind of come back at it. Uh, however, uh, Cuyahoga County heard about it and was really interested, so we had some meetings with them. And essentially, Cuyahoga County itself uh, decided to fund uh, this project and keep it tied kind of within their region of Ohio, if you will. Um, so for this particular project, again, it's a coaching type project for students who are using the Guard Scholarship Program. Uh, the requirements are kind of an either or. You need to be have a home of record from Cuyahoga or the neighboring counties. Uh, there are Geauga, Lake, Lorraine, Medina, and Summit. Uh, or you can be living somewhere else in the state of Ohio and attending a institution in Cuyahoga County. So you kind of have an either or uh, route there. Um, you, the student will receive coaching. They, they have to opt into this via the National Guard. Uh, they will receive coaching from a organization called Inside Track. Uh, Inside Track, without showing a whole bunch of charts and graphs and, and information, um, they are a pretty strong coaching organization. Uh, most notably, uh, recently in Indiana, they've done some pretty astounding things with um, straight out of high school students and whatnot and, and improving their success levels. Um, again, the things that we're looking at improving for this population is their retention, their completion, uh, looking at completion in 100% time. So everything with the National Guard Scholarship Program is funded and based on the fact that you will complete your associates in two years and you will complete your baccalaureate in four years. Um, so part of this project and the outcomes that are going to come from it is, is that still feasible for this population? Uh, does that work? Do we need to tweak legislation to extend that time frame at all? And then what does that do to the scholarship? Um, term to term persistence is going to be looked at and credit accumulation and, and the credit accumulation really, you know, and, and really term to term persistence both kind of go back into the completion in 100% time. Um, there hasn't been a lot of movement or changes and updates to the Guard Scholarship in a long time, uh, with the exception of what you heard at the very beginning, that it has been expanded to allow for apprenticeship programs and certificates. Um, part of this whole project is being done because they're, they're looking at ways to sort of expand the, the scholarship program as well as sort of be more uh, tactical about how the money is spent. Um, so, for example, in the past, when before the expansion, Students, if you wanted to take like the Ohio Police Officer Training Academy, which was a fairly popular course for the National Guard, um, you couldn't just sign up and take the, the OPATA courses and be done. Uh, you had to register in an actual associate degree program, uh, and then students would take the OPATA courses, they'd be done, and they would essentially drop, not, I won't say drop out, but they completed their certificate. They didn't want the associate's degree or the baccalaureate, and then they started working in their job field. And, and essentially that student would drop off um, or likely too, they, they were registered for courses. They wanted to be full time. They would register, you know, in a program, they would take courses that they didn't actually need because they only wanted a particular certification. Um, so we're kind of looking at a whole lot of data right now, just on the expansion totally outside of this project, but a lot of things are being looked at um, to make this a more effective scholarship program and to see essentially what do we need to update, what do we need to tweak, what do we need to change? Um, and then, you know, can we better allocate funds uh, for at the state level for the National Guard Scholarship Program? Uh, and I would highly assume there's significant discussion going around about expanding this for graduate degree programs as well. Um, that is not going to happen right off the bat, but when some of this project is underway and, and other things that we're researching are done, uh, there will probably start to be more conversations about expanding it for graduate degree programs because that's something that is definitely of interest uh, to the Ohio National Guard. Um, last slide here is just resources. 
um, put this in for the schools. I'll just kind of talk through them. So one of the resources, do not be afraid to contact us. So myself, uh, Abby, who you heard from earlier, um, absolutely available all the time. Um, our names are hyperlinked to our email addresses. So if you pull this up and click on it, it will um, open up your Outlook screen and, and try to send us an email. Um, that information's out there, we're available. Uh, I answer questions and help guide people about all kinds of different military and veteran issues. And, and I don't know everything, but where I'm at, I have a lot of contacts in a lot of different places. And if I don't know something, I can generally point you in the right direction to a group who does. Uh, I wanted to mention a few other things that exist in case you didn't know. Um, there is a group of individuals that the, the chancellor has that is called the Military Strategic Implementation Team. So I know that's a bit of a strange name, but that group was formed to handle the original implementation of all the legislation uh, from House Bill 488. And then after that implementation was done, we just never changed the name. So we, we've kept that name, but it is a group that's made up of a, a few uh, veterans and military center type directors, as well as a like a registrar individual, a financial aid individual, a chief academic officer, um, as well as like a student affairs type person. So we, we tried to pick experts from all areas of campuses and essentially what that group does is we'll meet and we'll talk through kind of, okay, what's going on in the world of military? Are there any major issues that, you know, we need to be aware of, that the chancellor needs to be aware of, that we need to handle? Uh, the next group is the Ohio Veterans Education Council. So that is the professional organization that exists for essentially the military folks on your campus. So just like there's OACRO and the, the financial aid organization, the, the OVEC is what they call themselves, the Ohio Veterans Education Council. Um, is the organization for that. They are uh, somewhat young. They, they were founded with House Bill 488, so they've been in existence since uh, the beginning of 2015. Um, they will be creating a web page. They're working on that now and have that out. Um, we have all of the contact information for those folks on our web page, or you can reach out to uh, Eric Budikoffer and Sharon Pappas uh, that are linked there. That's linked to their emails. Uh, they are the co-chairs. That's why their names appear there uh, for OVEC and they can get you added to their internal list serve. Uh, so one of the requirements of that Collegiate Purple Star is that you have to have a, a single point of contact on your campus and that individual has to serve on the, the OVEC group and represent your campus. So um, this has expanded in the last few years. It used to only be public institutions, but those 17 private institutions now participate in OVEC as well um, and is definitely becoming a, a very strong and, and good organization for, for everything military and veteran related on campuses. Uh, and that OVEC group also has made recommendations to the MSIT. Uh, they work um, together and, and several of those people are serve on both, both of those organizations as well. Uh, another one I would mention in, uh, that you've probably heard of in the past is SOCHI. It um, used to be the Southwest Ohio Council for Higher Education. Now it is the Strategic Ohio Council for Higher Education. Uh, they do have a veteran and military service committee that people can serve on. Uh, very similar to OVEC. They meet and talk about issues going on in their campus and they, they swap information back and forth and, and training programs and all those things that exist on their campuses um, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, this past um, October at the beginning of the month, uh, OVEC and SOCHI co-hosted a large gathering of military folks and I would highly assume that that relationship is probably going to grow and, and they're going to keep hosting probably at least a yearly conference type event uh, for everything that was very, very well attended, very good event. Uh, the last two things I would mention are uh, the Ohio Department of Veteran Services. Um, each of our counties have a veteran service uh, office commission uh, out there that can help service members in some way, shape or form. So there's certain things that might come up on campus that are maybe a little bit outside of what your campus can do. Um, there's at least some place in the county that you can recommend um, that they talk to for some different services and things that are available to service members. Uh, lastly, I would say the, the state approving agency, that is the entity that lives, it's kind of housed within the Department of Veteran Services that approves all of our campuses and anybody in the state who wants to utilize uh, GI Bill funding. So I don't know if it's you as an individual watching this, but somebody on your campus is responsible for submitting a quite significant amount of information to the state approving agency. Basically all of your course catalog information and anything that touches on veterans and military students all of that has to be submitted um, to the state approving agency. All your program information has to be submitted. Um, it's, it's, it's a heavy lift, um, but somebody out there on your campus should be doing that. And if not, 
state approving agency will start reaching out probably to your provost or president and saying, hey, we're not getting this information from your school. Um, so the link to their uh, agency and that group is there as well. Uh, with that being said, I think that is all for today. We want to say thank you and happy Thanksgiving. That's coming up uh, before we know it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for folks who might have any questions whatsoever. So don't be afraid to ask. Any questions? Or did we cover everything then? Beautifully. <laughs> and you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Here, this is Becky Barnes from Tri-C. Um, you can, um, I just attended last week the Kale Conference. So if you're getting emails or calls from people that attended the Kale Conference, it didn't come <laughs> from me. It did. I, <laughs> I gave your contact number to a number of people. So uh, I, you know, they said, you know, we don't know what's, and I said, let me, I'll, I'll give you contact information for someone who can help you. So uh, yeah, I was going to email you and I hadn't got a chance to do it yet. I just got back on Friday, but um, I said, if you want to talk to somebody and get you started, it, it'll be uh, Jared at the state. So. Awesome. Appreciate it. And and absolutely anybody on here that has my information, if somebody asks questions and you don't know, feel free to give them that information. Um, share Abby's email address as well um, so that we can get those those types of questions. I I get all kinds of people from all over the country that have asked questions or need help with military credit. And and frankly, I've done a lot of the private institutions in the state that have started doing more that are asking questions about how to do this. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask. All right. Yep, and like I said, we will post the uh, the PowerPoint along with the recording of this out on the web page, so you can access all those links uh, that we've shared in there. Any other questions? Okay. I think that is it. All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending and we'll look forward to the next Transfer Talk Tuesday. So thank you, take care and have a good rest of the day.